Hello and welcome. Uh, today we're going to discuss the second of the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, the second Noble Truth. In our last video we looked at the first Noble Truth, which is the Noble Truth of unsatisfactoriness or suffering, otherwise known as Dukkha. Dukkha is the Pali term. And looked at how what the Buddha showed is that all aspects of our life, both mental and physical, are in a sense unsatisfactory because all of them eventually will come to an end. All the good things that we experience will come to an end. And of course, life also has its bad experiences. That we are separated from things that we want, that we're sometimes put together with things that we don't want, that we have to undergo uh, aging, old age, that is to say old age, sickness, and death, which are things that we cannot avoid. These are all aspects of that first noble truth. Now, the second noble truth asks, why? do we experience this as suffering? In other words, we might look at all of these experiences I just ex expressed in the First Noble Truth and, and say, well, th these are simply causal phenomena. You know, certain things arise in the world, so they stay for a while and then they pass away. And so we ourselves, we arise and we stay for a while and we pass away. Why is that suffering? Why is that necessarily unsatisfactory? It's just a causal state of affairs. Well, the second noble truth tells us about this. It's the noble truth of samudaya, or the origin of suffering. It's going to be telling us why is this unsatisfactory? Where does this unsatisfactoriness arise from? Which is really the question we want, I think, most centrally to answer here, because otherwise, what are we going to do about it? So, if we look to the Buddha's purported first sermon, the first sermon as it comes down to us today, where he first defines, is supposed to have defined these terms, these ideas, these concepts, what he says is, now this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and passion, seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So this suffering or unsatisfactoriness that we feel doesn't really come from our raw experiences themselves, nor does it come from the external world as impinging upon us, but rather it comes from the way that we react to our experiences, the way that we react to the external world. In particular, that we react with what's called tanha, which is a, the Pali word, which is actually cognate to the English word thirst. They, that's the same root for both, for both terms. It, it's this thirst, it's this craving that we have in certain respects. Now, what respects are these? And here also, as in the last video, I'm going to go through the way the Buddha describes or defines the Second Noble Truth, uh, phrase by phrase, to understand what he's saying and why. First, he says that craving leads to renewed existence. Now, what does that mean? Uh, in a traditional sense, it, it's something very, very clear and, and, and plain, which is to say that the Buddha believes that it's our cravings that lead us to be reborn into future lives, literal future lives, so that when we die in this life, it's our craving that causes us to be reborn. If we crave for certain kinds of positive things, uh, skillful things, we will be reborn in a better life. If we crave for certain negative things or unskillful things, we can be reborn in a worse future life. That's the traditional understanding. However, there is also an understanding within this very life, and both within a traditional and, let's say, a more secular understanding, which is that our cravings lead us to be reborn into new lives all the time. We might say moment by moment, week by week, year by year. So, for example, when we're young, we may crave for our own beautiful bodies. We understand ourselves to be youthful and, let's say, beautiful. Others around us are the same. We may crave for these things. We may identify ourselves with aspects of, of the way we look, for example, or perhaps the way our minds work. We may think of ourselves as particularly intelligent, studious, you know, geeks who love studying stuff. I know I was one of them. We may identify ourselves with being uh, uh, stars on the field of play, you know, varsity athletes. 
we may identify ourselves in any number of ways. And I did actually a video on that very subject. I'll leave a link to that down below in the notes in case you want to uh, learn more about that sort of understanding of this kind of being reborn as we change. But we might say quickly that as we age, that our sense of self will, will change. So for example, as we get older, we may identify ourselves with being a mother or a father. We may identify ourselves with being a, a business person or uh, later on in life with being a retiree or being somebody who is ill all the time. Many people who with illnesses will identify themselves either subtly or more uh, extremely with being somebody who is sick all the time. There are an infinite number of ways that we can cling to life or cling to aspects of our own existence by craving for certain things in them, either positive or negative. So the Buddha goes on to say that these cravings that we have are ordinarily accompanied by delight and passion, seeking delight here and there. And I would say that this is so particularly in our youth, although it does continue as we get older as well, that our cravings are accompanied by various kinds of passion, various kinds of delight, various kinds of pleasure. These are ways that these words, all of these words from Pali can be understood. So, for example, we find aspects of our life particularly pleasurable. We find being a parent pleasurable, so we identify with that. We find uh, studying pleasurable, so we identify with that. We find success on the field of play and practice pleasurable, so we identify with that. We identify ourselves with various aspects that we find pleasurable. We crave for these things. As they go away, as we change and they go away, we crave for them all the more and we have, as a result, a sense of unsatisfactoriness as they inevitably go away because we want them more. We want the successes involved. We want the pleasures. We want the delights. So what makes our cravings so alluring is just this, that they are attached to these pleasures, that they surround, that they grasp at pleasures that we do have. And yet the irony is that, that although they are surrounded by pleasure so much of the time, and although they can be themselves pleasurable, they are in fact, the Buddha tells us, at the root of our deep discontent with life. They're at the root of this sense of unsatisfactoriness. The Buddha goes on to say that the way that we seek such delight is in craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So craving for sensual pleasures, basically that means that we crave seeing things that are beautiful around us, hearing things that are beautiful, tasting and smelling things that are beautiful, feeling things that are beautiful, and so on. And this, I think we, you know, for each of us it's going to be different what we're going to consider here, but in a general nutshell we can say, you know, for many of us, the, the the idea is that we sort of want to be in some beautiful spa on the beach or up in the mountains for the rest of our lives, right? A place where everything's beautiful around us, we have beautiful music, beautiful feeling of somebody giving us a massage, good food, good drink, all of these things. Now, of course, for you it may be somewhat different. Perhaps you prefer a more active life of the beauty of, of running in the fields or whatever. But my point is that if we reflect upon this, we'll realize that although this would be beautiful for a period of time and something that we would love to experience, within a relatively short period of time, we would get bored of it. You know, we, we'll, we'll, we would love to be on that in that spa for a day, maybe a week, but after a month, we're going to begin to say there's got to be something a little bit different that we can do. And this is part of that very unsatisfactoriness that we mentioned before, this craving for sensual pleasures. Because this is one of the irony about sensual pleasures is that we get inured to them, we get used to them, that we always need something more and better and different. Otherwise, what used to be pleasurable isn't anymore. And this is just one of the features of sense pleasures themselves and what, one of the things that makes them so problematic for the Buddha. Now, the second part is that we crave for continued existence. That is to say, we don't want to die. We want to be immortal in some sense. 
And I think we're all like that, or almost all of us are. And that's what makes confrontation with death such a problem for many of us. And one of the features, I think, of Buddhist practice is that part of it, a great part of it, we might even say the heart of Buddhist practice, is trying to come to terms with this fact of death and trying to come to terms with the fact that that, that is something that we have to experience and be used to and see up close. And so the Buddha had any number of practices involved with this, many of which we don't really look at very much nowadays because most people don't want to. They're, they're still uh, a little worried about death. But I think that's one of the things that we have to come to terms with, and that's one of the problems the Buddha sees here and part of what craving is all caught up in, is caught up in this idea that we want to remain alive. Now the other, the flip side of that is craving for extermination or non-existence. And some of us, I think, will know that some people in the world find life so very difficult, so very problematic, that they simply want not to exist. They want to cease to exist altogether. And this is, of course, a particularly unpleasant, sad, destructive uh, mindset. And the sort of thing that if you happen to feel it, you should definitely seek professional help. You should look for help from psychologists and psychiatrists, whoever it might be, who can help get you out of that, that point of view. The only thing to, to realize here is that the Buddha acknowledges this. He understood this, that this is indeed one way that people are. And it's just as deluded, just as problematic, just as unfortunate as its reverse. Um, it's, it's deluded to think that we could be eternally existing, that we could be we could never die, but it's also deluded to want to cease to exist completely. But in any event, at this point, I think we begin to see the, the dangers, the, the suffering, the unsatisfactoriness of life, and we begin to see its cause, the reason why life seems to us unsatisfactory. It's because we have these cravings which are, in the ultimate sense, not satisfiable. So the question then is, what do we do with that? Well, as I mentioned in the last video on the first noble truth, each of these noble truths has an associated task, a task that we associate with that truth that is, that is supposed to help us move forward. And what is that task when it comes to the second noble truth? Well, that task is abandonment, that we should work to abandon that craving. Now, in fact, what the Buddha says, or what's recorded in the Buddha's first sermon is that we're supposed to abandon the truth of the origin of suffering. And if we think about that for a minute, that doesn't make any sense. We're not supposed to, we're, we're not, we don't want to abandon the truth of the origin of suffering. We want to abandon the origin itself. And this phrasing in the, in the uh, Buddha's supposed first sermon is one of the reasons why scholars don't believe that it actually could have been actually spoken that way. It must have been changed and dealt with over the centuries between there, there and now. Something was lost in translation, if you like. But in any event, we, we get the point. The point is that we're to abandon craving. And what happens when we abandon craving? And that is the subject of the third noble truth. And I'll, when that video is ready, I will put a link to it up here on the screen so that you can see it. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, consider taking a look over at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and seeing if you want to help out the channel and get something in return for your donations. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.